Chapter 1 Translation I'm dead, at least from your point of view. How you can read this story or how it came to you is probably some miracle. I would suppose this story, or rather my story, is important enough to transcend the usual means of inspiration where you are. After all, what I'm about to tell you is something that, until now, no one has been permitted to disclose. The brother and apostle Paul said he saw it. He knew a man who saw it, but we know it was him. My journey is one of surpassing wonder. Metaphor and simile are the only way to understand it. Even now, after having experienced it, I cannot tell you the story without using symbols, images, and representations. It is a world between our world and the final destination. It is a waiting place for our resurrection, the nexus between that place not even metaphor can transcribe, and the created order of color, dimension, space, and time can give substance. It is the way station, the artist's studio. It is the second heaven. Unlike John, my journey is not apocalyptic, as scholars have come to label it. Besides, he lived to tell the tale. I presume it might as well be apocalyptic genre, knowing life as you did inside the grand narrative. My introduction probably seems so much gobbledygook already. As with life and identity itself, however, perhaps the unfolding of this narrative will provide illumination. The end came in the most prosaic way. I was in my hospital bed, unaware of the story unfolding around me. Those I love were nearby, but my wife's face was my last vision. Her face seemed to glow with a vivid aura while the periphery of my sight grew increasingly blurred and dim until all went dark. No fear surrounded me at that moment, only calm. Then, a swirl of light began to encompass my feet. It stirred progressively faster and faster like mixing chocolate syrup into milk. Quickly the cloud of light engulfed my body and I felt the sense of moving forward. I did not feel alone, for the swirling light seemed alive, comforting me, holding my hand. I could feel the acceleration as I moved into a tunnel of light brighter than I could ever have imagined in my former life, more brilliant than the sun. As I lifted, I felt my arms float horizontally to my chest and my feet dangle. The scene was like the opening credits of Doctor Who as the TARDIS hurdles through time, except this was no special effect of human imagination. It was real. Later I realized that reality is a slippery concept, but my experience wasn't as vague as a dream even then. Its vividness and concrete experience flowed with my consciousness, consistent and continuous. All my senses were aroused. I could see, hear, and feel all in perfect sensation. I never felt more present as the eternal became tangible. Cuddled by the mist of light, I heard voices singing as I moved. It sounded like Gregorian chants within a large chamber or cathedral, and their voices absorbed into the clouds of light like synesthesia. But equally, I could feel love and joy like warmth across my avatar. It seemed to radiate with the passing ebb and flow of brightness, supplying the visual sense of movement. Suddenly, everything I experienced vanished, and I stood before an open field of green grasses with deep, rich, violet, and red flowers all underneath a cloudless blue sky. A gentle wind tickled the tips of the grassland. I could feel its cool caress on my face. I wondered what other life this vision contained when suddenly... A group of blackbirds caught my attention as they took off from the ground in unison and settled on a tree in the distance, making quite a ruckus. Standing beneath the sheltering branches of that tree was someone I recognized. Could it possibly be her? I ran toward her, skipping through the knee-high brush as my imagined heart raced along with me. As I approached, her form took shape. There, dressed in white, her long brown hair styled with an unfamiliar braided hairstyle, holding a brown wicker basket, was my mom. She looked young and vibrant. Gone were the signs of age and disease, only blush in her cheeks and brightness in her eyes. She smiled broadly as I reached for her. It is so good to see you, son. We all expect our family here, she joyfully greeted. Here, I get to be trim and fit, she continued jokingly. I had many questions, but could only muster... This place? Yes, she replied, 
We get to use our God-given imagination in its design. You designed a field? I answered in amazement. We all did. As you can tell, we are a bit formulaic, she replied with a grin. Everybody makes a field. Ideas like the Elysian fields in literature or the movies are ingrained stories, you know. I wanted to know more, but she interrupted. We have much to talk about, and I know you have an eternity of questions. We all do, she assured. First, I have some special instructions for you. She handed me a computer tablet with a digital pen from the basket. I'm unsure what top of the line should be for heaven, but I'm sure this tablet and pen would be it. Greatly astounded, I asked, Heaven uses computers? Smiling as if she had heard this before, she explained, Everything here is appearance and metaphor. We would have given you a pencil if you had come a century ago. Her jovial manner was new to me, though oddly still like my remembrance of her. However, her boisterousness over her attempt at humor was magnetic, and I joined in. So, what is this for? I asked politely. Write down what you see and hear. You have been given favor for your account of your experiences will be translated back to where you came from. Her voice suddenly solemn. I felt a quickening of the wind as my mother sat down at the base of the tree and pulled out an apple from the basket. Want one? I have as many as I need. Come and sit with me for a few minutes. I had more questions than an appetite. So much I don't understand. What will I be shown? Why have I been given this task? All in good time, son. You were such an inquisitive child, she said with a new smile. I don't think I had ever heard my mother use such vocabulary, but it seemed she had been waiting a long time to use the word inquisitive, using it at just the right time. I suppose eternity provides the opportunity. As I gazed at the sky through the tree branches, my mother seemed filled with renewed energy and liveliness. Even though time had passed, my memories lingered beneath the shade of the tree, while all regrets or worries flew away like the birds that led me there. The desire to spend more time with her and have conversations was overwhelming. Few people who reach this point go back, she said, eliciting some small talk. Some, though, get a special glimpse, usually not fully understanding how imagination works, the power of God, or the grand story. They go back sometimes with some misinterpretations that the critic uses. They don't realize that this place is not the highest heaven. They take back more of their own imagination than God's. The critic? I queried. Yes, the devil, she replied. But you are drawing me into the questions. We don't have the opportunity right now. Let's go to get you started on your mission. When you are done, come back here for the reunion. Your grandparents and cousins are eager to see you, and above all, you are to stand before the Lord. So that will be fun. She took my hand as the haze of light swelled, enveloping us both. Then, almost at once, we stood before a large edifice of many stones like granite. It stretched to either side as far as I could see, and was just as tall. It had windows as large as any I have ever met on earth. They were about eight feet tall and thirteen feet wide. The inner part of the windows had two vertical panes, one about four feet from the left and the other about five feet from the right. Looking in the windows, I saw many figures. I assumed they were angels and others like me, milling about holding books, tablets, or paper. I effortlessly pushed open a grand entrance, greeted by a picturesque garden with abundant fruit trees. Many people were wandering around helping themselves to a harvest as the fruit seemed pleasing and good for food. The voice of my mother interrupted my awestruck gaze. Blessed are you, son. You are to visit the Librarian of Heaven. Much must be revealed now for the first time since the beginning of the grand story. You sound so biblical, I replied nervously. Nervously? I was shocked that I felt nervous. I am honored to serve, but I must admit, I believe that no one felt any negative emotions in heaven. I voiced my thoughts to her with a tone of sincerity and curiosity. Son, there's no danger, no tears here. Yet you must truly sense the profound meaning and love to grasp heaven's beauty. Even now you should strive to comprehend the wonder and awe of your God. Without a hint of danger, 
the sublime remains elusive. To glimpse beyond the beauty of heaven to the sublime, you must also grasp the story's gravity. If you're feeling nervous now, wait until you're standing before heaven's very throne, she shared with me. Then, to my further astonishment, she quoted a poem. As we gaze at the beauty of the master's art, we catch a glimpse of the artist's heart. His love of story is revealed in each note. Each stroke, every creative word wrote, it's the imagination of unfathomable eloquence, understanding, hope, fear, and consequence. Before the artist's palette is no ugliness or sin. At his feet we lay every brush, instrument, and pen. Then the library door opened, and a bronze-looking child appeared. He was dressed in a dark red cloak with gold stripes on the sleeve reminiscent of sergeant stripes. While ostensibly demure and diminutive, his voice was powerful. Come up here, and I will show you what is next, his voice boomed. The mist of light blew past him as I obediently walked up the steps toward the open door and across the colossal threshold. See you soon, I heard my mother's voice fade away.